Part 4. Society of Domination and Exploitation. Capitalism and State. Capitalism as a system has developed since the Middle Ages and was established in the 18th and 19th centuries in Western Europe. It constituted itself as an economic, political, and social system, basing itself on the relations between two antagonistic classes. On one hand, that which is called the bourgeoisie, and which we will, we will treat in this text as capitalists, holders of private ownership of the means of production, who contract workers by means of wage labor. On the other hand, that which is called the proletariat, and which we will treat in this text as workers, who, possessing nothing more than their labor power, have to sell it in exchange for a wage. As, as we emphasized earlier, the wage laborer, classic object of analysis in the socialist theses of the 19th century, for us constitutes today only one of the categories of the exploited classes. The aim of the capitalists is the production of goods in order to obtain profits. Quote, the, capitalists, the capitalist enterprise is not concerned with the needs of society. Its sole purpose is to increase the profits of the business owner. End quote. By means of wage labor, the capitalists pay workers as little as possible and usurp from them all the surplus of their labor, which is called surplus value. This happens because in order to increase their profits, the capitalists must have the lowest costs or spend as little as possible. Selling their goods at the highest prices the market can pay, they remain with the difference between what they spend and what they earn the profit. To contain costs and thus increase profits, the capitalists have various recourse, recourses. Among them to increase productivity and decrease the costs of production, there are several ways for this to be done, such as to impose a higher work rate on workers and reduce the wages paid to them. This relationship between capitalists and workers generates social inequality, one of the great evils of the society in which we live. This has already been established by Proudhon when he investigated the subject in the 19th century. Quote, I affirmed then that all the causes of social inequality can be reduced to three. One, the free appropriation of collective force. Two, inequality in trade. Three, the right to profit or fortune. And as this triple way of usurping the goods of others is essentially the domination, the dominion of property, I denied the legitimacy of property and proclaimed its identity as theft." End quote. For us, private property, as Proudhon noted, is theft, since from wage labor it gives to the capitalist the surplus of the worker's labor. This property, after, after, quote, stripping the worker by usury, kills them slowly by exhaustion, end quote. Besides being a system that creates and maintains social inequality, capitalism is based on domination and consequent exploitation. Domination exists when a person or a group of people use, quote, the social force of others, the dominated, and consequently consequently their time, in order to accomplish their objectives of the dominator, which are not the objectives of the subjugated agent." End quote. The capitalist system is characterized by the utilization of the labor power of the worker for the enrichment of the capitalists, and is therefore a, dom a dominative and exploitative system since it, signif since it, quote, signifies the ability and right to live off the exploitation of alien labor, the right to exploit the labor of those who do not have property or capital and are therefore forced to sell their productive power to the lucky owners of both, end quote. This relationship between capital and labor playing out on the market is not the same for both sides since the capitalists go to the market in order to obtain profit, while the workers are made to do so out of a need to work, without which they run the risk of experiencing want and not having the minimum living conditions. 
It is an is a quote encounter between an initiative for profit and the other from hunger, between the master and the slave. End quote. Besides this, unemployment causes that when the capitalists go to the market, they encounter workers in abundance. As there is a great supply of workers, then there is a greater supply of workers than there is a demand. Quote, the poor neighborhoods of the city and the villages are full of wretches whose children cry in front of empty plates. Thus, the factory is not even finished yet, and the workers are already coming to ask for work. One hundred are required and a thousand present themselves. End quote. Thus, to the capitalists, it fits to impose working conditions. To the workers, it fits to accept them, since, quote, they are taken for fear of finding themselves replaced by others to sell themselves at the lowest price. Once they have found themselves in a state of poverty, the worker is forced to sell their labor for almost nothing, and by selling this product for almost nothing, sinks into an ever greater misery." End quote. Being a complex system, capitalism combines several forces of production and social classes. Peasants, despite being part of a productive process that is pre-capitalist, are still subject to the competitive requirements of the capitalist market, which means the need for fundamental elements for production that are sold on the capitalist market. In competition, due to productive and technological difficulties, they are at a disadvantage in relation to the big agribusiness companies. There are also those peasants who sell their labor power who who we can consider rural workers of a traditional capitalist system. Peasants, as we have already seen, are also part of the group of exploited classes. It is even said that capitalism should not be divided into two large classes, that of the capitalists and that of the workers, but indeed three, there being a third class called the managerial class, responsible for the control of decisive aspects of capitalism and personalizing another important aspect of capitalism, which is that of the hierarchical division of labor. Throughout the history of capitalism, this class has been becoming increasingly part of the capitalist class, especially by the interests defended in the process of class struggle. Today, the figure of the traditional bourgeois, the proprietor, is becoming increasingly less common. The control of companies being performed by the managers and the owners increasingly being multinational groups or even shareholders that no one knows. Actually, in the large majority, the class of managers is part of the capitalist group, or what we might call the ruling class. There are also other actors in the capitalist market, such as workers in the trade and service sectors who distribute goods from, from the capitalist enterprises or perform work for them. Both sectors follow the logic of capitalism to a greater or lesser extent and also act within the competition of the market, very often using wage labor, sustaining the proprietors who enjoy the fruits of this unjust relationship between capital and labor and who have the intention of generating profit. As part of, as a system that reproduces injust, injustice, Capitalism separates manual and intellectual labor. This separation is the result of inheritance and also of education, since there's a different education for the rich and the poor. Thus, quote, as long as you have two or more levels of instruction for the different layers of society, you will necessarily have classes, meaning to say political and economic privileges for a small number of fortunates and slavery and misery for the majority." End quote. Throughout its history, capitalism has evolved, becoming involved in the political structures of European countries in the late 19th century, leading to imperialism and reaching its current phase of expansion, which can be called economic globalization. According to the analysis of sub Subcomandante Marcos of the Zapatista army, it is already, quote, it is already not an imperialist power in the classic sense of the term, one that dominates the rest of the world, but a new extranational power, end quote. 
In general terms, economic globalization is characterized by an integration on a global scale of the processes of production, distribution, and exchange. Production is carried out in several countries. Goods are imported and exported in enormous quantities and over long distances. Stimulated since the 1970s and 1980s, globalization became widespread around the world. Quote, basing itself from the ideological, philosophical, and theoretical point of view on the doctrine of neoliberalism, end quote, which advocates the free market and minimal state. The basic idea is that capital procures locations with the best conditions for its reproduction. As production necessarily requires the labor power of the workers, there's a migration of the productive spheres of capitalist enterprise to countries whose, quote, production cost is lower, end quote. Countries with weak labor envir slash environmental legislation, weak trade union organization, high levels of unemployment, etc. In sum, companies seek countries slash regions where exploitation can take place without state intervention, allowing them to pay what they want, such that they are not obliged to provide benefits to workers that they that they, workers, can be dismissed whenever they, capitalists, wish, and that there are always many more workers wanting to fill the vacancies, allowing for production costs to become increasingly less. Precarious work is sought and encouraged. This system, if it, it on the one hand leaves unemployed in areas with optimal conditions, on the other allows for the blackmail that causes precarity to be accepted and threatens the organization of workers who are increasingly more controlled and pushed to the periphery as described by Chomsky. Quote, the concepts of efficiency and healthy economy, favorites of the rich and privileged, have nothing to offer the growing sectors of the population that are not profitable and that are pushed into poverty and despair. If they cannot be confined to the slums, they will have to be controlled in another way." End quote. Neoliberalism, which stimulates the free flow of capital, but not the free movement of people, nor the comparison of working conditions, calls into question the whole condition of welfare, which was imposed on states during large mobilizations that marked the world in the 19th and 20th centuries. Capitalism has been seeking new spaces, expanding itself both internally as well as externally, creating new capitalist enterprises through privatization and fostering false needs by means such as advertising, which did not correspond to the real demands of society. Quote, neoliberal doctrines, independent of what you, what you think of them, debilitate education and health, decrease social inequality, or, sorry, increase social inequality and reduce labor's share in the distribution of income. Contem end quote. Contemporary capitalism is also responsible for the major ecological crisis, devastating the world today. Motivated by the logic of profit, private enterprises are responsible for transferring the entire hierarchy of classes to the relationship between people and the environment. Pollution, deforestation, global warming, destruction of rare species, and imbalances in the food chains are just some of the consequences of this relationship. Quote, the hierarchies, classes, property systems, and political institutions that emerged with social domination were transferred conceptually to the relationship between humanity and nature. This was also increasingly seen as a, more, as a mere resource, an object a raw material to be exploited as ruthlessly as slaves on a plantation." End quote. Brazil, being well integrated into this globalized logic for, reasons, for reason of policies adopted by its past governments, shares the global consequences of this new phase of capitalism. We consider the state the set of political powers of a nation that takes shape by means of political, legislative, judicial, military, and financial institutions, etc. And in this way, the state is broader than the government. The state, since its inception in antiquity, passing through the 
Egypt of the pharaohs, and the military slave state of Rome has always been an instrument for perpetuating inequality and a, liber and a liberty exterminating element, whatever the existing mode of production. This dominating institution has, in the course of history, known periods of greater or lesser strength, requiring attention to the specific time and place. The state as we observe it today, the modern state, has its origin in the 16th century. In the Middle Ages, with the aim of destroying the civilization of the cities, the modern barbarians ended up making into slaves all those who once organized themselves based on free initiative and free undertaking, free understanding. The whole of society was leveled based on submission to the landlord declaring that the church and state were to be the only links between individuals, that only these institutions would have the right to defend commercial, industrial, and artistic interests, etc. The state was constituted by means of domination, to speak on behalf of society, since it was judged to be society itself. The state has been characterized by a, quote, double game, end quote of promising the rich to protect them from the poor and promising the poor to protect them from the rich. Gradually, the town's victims of authority that were dying bit by bit were given to the state, which also developed its role as conqueror, moving on to wage wars against other states, seeking to expand itself and conquer new territories. The effect of the state over the cities and urban regions was disastrous. The state's role in the urban areas in, this, in the period of the 16th and 17th centuries was, quote, to annihilate the independence of the cities, to rob the rich guilds of the merchants and artists, to centralize external trade in their hands and ruin it, to seize the entire internal administration of the guilds and submit interior trade, as well as the manufacturing of all things, even in their most minute detail, to a cloud of functionaries killing, in this way, industry and the arts, taking possession of the local militias and of the entire municipal administration, crushing through taxes the weak, the weak to the benefit of the rich, and ruining the countries with wars. After, end quote, after the Industrial Revolution arose the so-called social question, which obliged states to develop assistance plans in order to minimize the impacts of capital on labor. In the late 19th century arose, as an alternative to liberalism, a more interventionist conception of the state, which, if on the one hand sought to create policies of social welfare, on the other implemented methods to contain the advancement of socialist initiatives, already quite strong at the time. Today, the state has two fundamental objectives. The first of them, ensuring the conditions of the production and reproduction of capitalism, and the second, to ensure its legitimacy and control. For this reason, the state today is a strong supporting pillar of capitalism. The state extrapolates the political ambit and functions as an economic agent of capitalism working to prevent or minimize the role of its crises or of the falls of its profit rates. This can happen in several ways, by granting loans to central sectors of the economy, incentivizing the development of sectors of the economy, scrapping debts, reformulating the system of import-export, subsidizing products, generating revenue, generating revenue through the sale of products from state-owned enterprises, etc. Assistance plans to have an important role as they increase assistant plans also have an important role as they increase the purchasing power of sectors of the population, moving and heating the capitalist economy. Also, the state creates laws aimed at guaranteeing the long-term accumulation of, of the capitalists and ensuring that the capitalist's thirst for profit does not put the system itself at risk. In the course of the historical process, it was noted that there is no way of sustaining a system based only on repression. The state, which sustained itself in this way for so many years, was gradually being modified. 
looking to guarantee the legitimacy of capitalism. A state that clearly defends the position of the capitalists could intensify class struggle, and there is therefore nothing better from the capitalist point of view than to give it an aspect of neutrality. Giving it the appearance of an independent or even autonomous organism in relation to the ruling class or to capitalism itself. Aiming always to calm the class struggle, the state developed measures in favor of the exploited classes, since with better living conditions, there would be less chance of radicalism. On the other hand, organized workers, movement, or organized workers movements were able to impose measures on the state that would bring them benefits, even at the expense of the capitalists. As with representative democracy, measures that improve conditions for workers always function for the state as an ideological tool to pass off this idea of neutrality, independence, and autonomy. However, it should serve as a lesson to show that as the state has an obligation to guarantee this legitimacy, there's often space for organized workers to impose measures in their favor. It being necessary, therefore, quote, to snatch from the government and capitalists all the improvements of the political and economic order such that they may make the conditions of struggle less difficult for us and increase the number of those who struggle consciously. It is necessary, therefore, to snatch them by means that prepare the way for the future and do not imply the recognition of the current order." End quote. Nevertheless, one should bear in mind that the state as a strong pillar of capitalism seeks to sustain it, and if capitalism is a system of exploitation and domination, the state cannot do anything else but sustain the class relations that exist in its midst. In this way, the state defends the capitalists to the detriment of the worker, who possessing only their, ar only, quote, their arms as wealth has nothing to expect from the state, encountering in it but an organization designed in order to impede their emancipation at whatever price. End quote. Any attempt to change the state carried out by the exploited classes, classes is harshly repressed by the state. When ideology does not work, repression and control follow. As it has a monopoly on the use of violence in society, it always uses it to enforce the laws. And as laws were made in order, to, in order that the privileges of capitalist society could be maintained, then repression and state control are always to sustain order. That is, to maintain the privileges of capitalism and keep the ruling class in domination. At the slightest sign of the exploited classes that signifies a threat, the state brutally represses, always aiming at the continuation of the system, which has violence as one of its central pillars. Contrary to what the authoritarian socialists believe, and still believe, the state is not a neutral organism that can work at the service of the capitalists or of the workers. If anarchists have written so much about the state, it is justifiably because the critique of capitalism was consensus between libertarians and authoritarians. The divergence was around the state. The authoritarians supported the capture of the state and the dictatorship of the proletariat as an intermediate stage, which was falsely called socialism between capitalism and communism. This socialism is a form of governing of the majority by the minority, quote, having the effect of consolidating directly and inevitably the political and economic privileges of the governing minority and the economic and political slavery of the popular masses, end quote. We hold that, quote, no state, no matter how democratic their forms may be, not even the reddest political republic, popular only in the sense of the lie known under the name of representation of the people, is able to give to these what they need, that is, the free organization of their own interests from the bottom up, without, inter without any inter interference, guardianship, or coercion from above. Because every state, even the most republican and democratic, even pseudo-popular, is nothing else in its essence, if not the governing of the masses from the top to bottom, with an intellectual and therefore privileged minority saying it understands the true interests of the people more than the people themselves." End quote. The position of the libertarians, which we hold today, 
is that for the construction of socialism, the state must be destroyed, together with capitalism, by means of the social revolution. This because, quote, who says the state who says state necessarily says domination and qu consequently slavery? A state without slavery, declared or concealed, is inconceivable. This is why we are enemies of the state. End quote. The state thinks it understands the needs of the people better than the people themselves and supports a hierarchical form of management of society, constituting the means by which the class the by which the class present in its exercises domination over the others, those that are not part of the state. Any state creates relations of domination, exploitation, violence, wars, massacres, and torture under the pretext of protecting the citizen, as well as subjugating, quote, the provinces and cities that comprise the state, which, as natural groups, should enjoy full and complete autonomy. These will, on the contrary, be governed and administrated not by themselves as befits the associated provinces and cities, but by central authority and as conquered populations." End quote. In the same way as dictatorial socialism, representative democracy argues that it is possible to have change through the state by delegating our rights to do politics to a class of politicians that enter the state in order to represent us we are giving a mandate without any control to someone that makes decisions for us there's an inevitable division between the class that does politics and the classes that follow at the outset we can already affirm that representative democracy alienates politically seeing as it separates the people from those who do politics on behalf of the people councillors, deputies, senators, mayors, governors, etc. The more that the politicians are responsible for politics, the less the people engage in politics, and the more they remain alienated and distant from the making of decisions. This obviously condemns the people to a position of spectator, and not that of master of oneself, directly responsible for solving their own problems. Quote, the emancipation of the proletariat therefore being impossible in any state that may exist, and that the first condition of this emancipation is the destruction of all states." End quote. Politicians represent the hierarchy and separation between leaders and led, within and outside of their own parties. To be elected political parties must, to, to be elected, political parties must obtain numerical relevance in the vote and for this need to elect a significant number of candidates. Politicians are then th treated as a commodity to be sold on the electoral market. In order to grow, parties do anything, divert money, abandon programs, make alliances with anyone, etc. Politicians do not do politics based on popular will, but make decisions that favor the party and its own interests, going on to increasingly like the taste of power. After all, politicians and parties want to retain their po positions of powers, positions and powers, which becomes the, and end, which becomes an end in itself. After all, politicians and parties want to retain their positions and powers, which becomes an end in itself. Discussions of the important issues of society, which is already limited, seeing as though Parliament and the state itself are pillars of capitalism, and therefore do not allow for its roots to be modified, is not even touched upon, is never a priority. Representative democracy being conservative, limiting even the little progresses that could occur. For this reason, we must not delegate politics to, quote, people without any conviction, who turn coats between liberals and conservatives and are allowed to influence by promises, positions, flattery, or, pic or panic. This small group of non-entities who, by giving or refusing their votes, decide all the questions of the country. It is they who make or shelve laws. It is they who support or drop the ministries and change the political direction." End quote. 
This critique of the state is not linked to one or other form of state, but to all its forms. Therefore, any project of social transformation that points to the social revolution and libertarian socialism must have the end of capitalism as well as the state as an objective. Although we hold that the state is one of the strongest pillars of capitalism, we do not believe that with the end of capitalism, the state would necessarily cease to exist. Today we know that we should that we sh today we know that we should confuse ourselves neither with the context of the 19th century, which showed a divergence on the question of the state between socialists, and for this the great emphasis on writings on the subject, nor with the context of the Euro of the Europe of that time. We know that the conditions of Brazil are specific. And if we can apply these critiques to the state today, we must know that our reality is particular and that the direction of the world economy has had profound influence over the form of state which we live. Finally, one thing is sure, capitalism and the state are still today the foundations of society of domination and exploitation, constituting for all the countries of the civilized world a single universal problem. Therefore, our ideal is still, quote, total and definitive emancipation from our economic exploitation and the yoke of the state, end quote.